detail that sometimes oh hello we just started recording so hi everybody who's listening um so i'm talking about the the supposed or the gap between academic and industrial research and batteries so this is a big problem this is where some of the problems arise in kind of the communication even between these two sides so this is uh this is kind of my philosophy on this how can academic researchers best contribute well there's a lot of different ways this is different for everybody uh, one way, and one of the things we focus on in my group and a lot of other researchers around the world do as well, is that um, it's important to know as an academic researcher or, or a national lab researcher kind of where your limitations are. So uh, if you focus on fundamental mechanisms and, and trying to develop new materials and understand how they work, that, that they could then be potentially scaled up in a, in a larger scale effort, uh, that is usually a pretty good approach. And a lot of uh, a lot of academic researchers are focused on this. So, you know, here's my philosophy. And I'm not saying this is what you should do either if you're in battery research, but this is sure, how I think sure. about it. Um, you know, we, we choose in my group, we choose scientific questions that we think will be really important for advancing the research community's understanding. Um, we choose materials and systems that, that could be commercially relevant. This is kind of a hard thing to do sometimes because um, there are you know materials that could be relevant in the future but it's unclear if they will be um, but that's an important choice to make and, and very importantly i think this is where uh in the battery field sometimes this is this is a challenge uh because we always want to you know make our our uh results look as good as possible but it's, i think it's important to make sure we take it with a grain of salt and, and not over claim on battery performance especially when your testing conditions are different than commercially required. So I'm not I'm not really saying all this to indicate that I think that people are doing a bad job. I think the academic community is really improving in this area. We're all learning, but uh, it is a big challenge. It's a challenge to balance these different aspects when we're thinking about fundamental research versus very applied research. So that's my uh, that's my philosophy and my thoughts on this. And some of you uh, may be kind of bored at this point. This is new, you're not your research area, but um, I think it's an important point um, just to kind of uh, promote the, the interrelationship and, and uh, collaboration between industrial and academic researchers in batteries, probably more so than we do today. All right, so I'm going to move on now. That's my perspective on that. Now I'm going to jump into my research group's work on solid state batteries. And um, solid state batteries are an emerging battery technology, I would say, that in which there's a lot of industrial interest. So I think my comments applied um, uh, previously. And the reason why there's a lot of interest is because uh, they could have both higher energy density and they could potentially improve safety. And so this is uh, very exciting. The way that a solid state battery would have to be arranged. So this is a, a, a schematic of a conventional lithium ion battery where you have an elect two electrodes and a separator, and then there's liquid electrolyte throughout the whole cell. In a solid state battery, you take that liquid which conducts ions and you replace it with a solid material. So you can see that here. Um, so the reason why this could be higher energy density is because it's thought that this new solid electrolyte material could enable higher capacity electrodes as well that can, that can hold more lithium per, per weight or per volume. So this um, potentially could be used for electric vehicles to, of course, make them drive longer on a charge. They could also be used to enable new applications uh, that require high energy density like electric flight or hybrid electric flight. So th these this battery system is very interesting, I would say, from a fundamental perspective. And of course, uh, technologically, it's very relevant. There are a bunch of startup companies and larger companies that are working on um, these systems. It turns out that over the last decade, I think we've learned that these systems are very complicated. And it seems maybe kind of simple. You take the liquid electrolyte, you replace it with a solid, maybe you're good to go. It's really, uh, really quite complicated. Um, and the main complication arises from the interactions between the solid electrolyte material, which conducts the ions, and the electrode materials. And there's uh, chemical interactions, there's mechanical interactions, there's instabilities and interfaces. There can be um, growth of filaments and dendrites of lithium through these solid electrolytes. There can be loss of contact interfaces. I'm kind of listing all these very rapidly. So if you don't know much about this, it might be kind of confusing. But the point is that uh, even understanding what's happening at these solid solid electrochemical interfaces has been a major focus in the last few years and uh, the community has learned quite a bit and that's kind of what i'll talk about today actually uh my team my team's goal has been to focus on understanding what's happening at these interfaces and then relate that to electrochemical behavior and see if we can provide some guidelines and engineering um, rules for improving performance and so that's what i'll talk about i'll talk about a few different things today um 
The first is uh, focused on um, lithium metal anodes in solid state batteries. And I'll talk about some of our uh, characterization of lithium evolution, and then some of our recent work on anode free solid state batteries. I'll, I'll mention what that is in a little while. And then I'll finish up with some of our work on alloy based anodes for solid state batteries. Uh, and I'll finish everything, you know, in the allotted time. So don't worry, um, you'll have plenty of time to, you know, do something after this talk as well. I won't take too long. All right, so I'll start with our work on lithium metal anodes. And um, when we, uh, a few years ago, uh, this is uh, maybe three years ago now, or even four years ago, there were some really nice papers that came out of a, a number of different groups, Peter Bruce's group, Jeff Sakamoto's group, um, Jurgen Yannick's group. And they were showing this electrochemical evidence for contact loss at solid solid electrochemical interfaces. So what this means, so that, that's what these plots show. Um, this idea of contact loss is the following. If you have a solid electrolyte as shown here, this is a sulfide material in contact with lithium metal, which is your electrode. As you strip the lithium metal, as you oxidize it, the ions move through the solid electrolyte, but the lithium metal actually is consumed, right? And so if you try to strip the lithium too quickly, um, quickly enough that neither self diffusion nor mechanical deformation of the lithium can can keep up basically then by necessity you have to form these voids at the interface and this is not good for a battery system when you have voids at an electrochemical interface or loss of contact then um, you have a higher over potential and then bad things start to happen so that's what you see in these electrochemical plots up here so this was predicted to happen based on these curves and that's this was kind of what was thought to be causing this behavior but we wanted to investigate this in more detail and so we we carried out um some some x-ray tomography experiments. So that's what I'll show you first here. So this is some of our work where we, we made these custom cells. These are custom solid state battery cells. In these cells, we're using a lithium tin phosphorus sulfide solid electrolyte. This is a, a high conductivity sulfide material. And these cells are very small. They're much smaller than a normal solid state battery cell. Uh, they're only about two millimeters wide. They're designed specifically so that we can image them with x-rays at a synchrotron. Synchrotron is shown here. This is the advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab. Very large instrument, few football fields wide, and produces high energy x-rays that can do lots of things, including imaging. So in these experiments, we, we build our battery in these little cells. We take it to the beam line, and then we, we operate the cell. Here, we're applying a current in one direction, and then we're reversing the direction. And every um, 15 minutes, we, we take an image. And these images in tomography are three-dimensional images where we, where we capture three-dimensional information about the entire cell stack. So it's really very useful information. Some of the, um, the metrics are shown down here. So what does this look like? This is one way of looking at the data. This is a video. I hope you can see it through the screen. But um, what this is showing, it's, now this is just a two-dimensional slice. It's a video of this 10-hour process. As you can see, there's lithium at the top. This is the dark region at the top. There's lithium at the bottom. And there's this thick region in between, which is the solid electrolyte, is polycrystalline. And um, the main thing you can see on this size scale, we're looking at the entire cell here, is that as we're applying a current and then reversing that current, what happens is there's this intermediate region, the uh, intermediate contrast region that forms at the bottom and then at the top later. And this is actually what we call the interphase. This is a uh, an electrochemically reduced phase that is the solid electrolyte that's basically reduced by lithium. And we can watch it grow because of its different contrast in these experiments. And we analyze this in great detail in this paper down here. Um, but this is not the main thing that I want to talk about today. Um, the main thing I'll talk about is these experiments, in addition to interphase growth, they also let us visualize contact loss, which is what I kind of started out with. So this is an example of that. This is a, an image from one of these cells. Um, at the beginning of the process, so before we do any electrochemistry, and this is showing the lithium in contact with the salt electrolyte. The lithium is the darker region. And um, the interface between the two, it's kind of rough, but um, the contact seems to be fairly good. There's, there's not any obvious contact loss. After we've stripped the lithium, the lithium decreases in thickness, as you can see. Uh, this is exactly the same location, I should say. So we're looking before and after at the same location. And so thinner lithium, um, what you see, though, now is that these dark regions at the interface and based on um, uh, contrast analysis across all these cells, um, this is basically the darkest region that appears in the cells is similar to voids that occur in the midst of the solid electrolyte. And so we conclude that after stripping, these dark spots are voids. And you can see here they have the, the lowest intensity of any point in the in the image. 
So these voids are we're directly observing their growth at the interface after stripping lithium. This is another way to visualize this sort of data. This is now kind of a three-dimensional view of the interface. It's a little confusing, perhaps. This the box itself here is the solid electrolyte, and then the lithium metal is on top of the box, and so you don't really see that. It's transparent in this image. But what you do see are these purple spots. The purple spots are now um, void volume, so it's anywhere where there's not no contact between the lithium and the solid electrolyte. So at the beginning of the experiment, there's some void volume. As we strip lithium, though, you can see at the end, there's a lot of voids that have grown in. So this is visualizing the voids in three dimensions now. And I think the most useful way to look at this is here. And just one more way of looking at it. Um, this plot up here shows the electrochemical behavior where we're applying a current and then reversing the current. And this is mapping out the total interface contact area on both interfaces as a function of time. That's the, the yellow and the green dots, uh, the points. And so um, interestingly, you can see that the top interface, there's two interfaces, of course. The top interface um, doesn't really change that much, actually, during the process. There's not much change in interfacial area. The bottom interface, though, there's a little bit of a decrease. At the end of the experiment, there's a significant loss of contact area at the bottom interface. And that uh, occurs as the electrochemical, as the overpotential on the electrochemical curve increases substantially. And so this, this direct measurement here allows us to conclude that the, uh, the loss of contact is driving this overpotential increase, which is kind of what we set out to do. Uh, but interestingly, you can look at these images below. These are, these are now, um, we call these contact area maps, and this is for the bottom interface. Uh, what these are basically, if you were to project through the interface and then make a, a, a yellow pixel wherever there, wherever there is a, a, a pixel of contact that you're observing in the image, then you have, that's, a, that's a, a, a yellow pixel. And so the yellow pixel means contact. As we go along and strip, you can see that there's some loss of contact. There's a little bit of loss of contact, but as we go from nine and a quarter hours um, to 10 hours, over that last 45 minutes, we have a significant loss of contact uh, at that interface. And that's when this big potential increase happens. And so not only do we have an overall contact measurement, uh, contact area measurement, we have a local map of contact area as well, which is really powerful. And the reason why that's powerful, I'm almost done with this here, so bear with me, um, is because we're able to analyze the distribution of sizes of these contact <laughs> spots um, as we go along. And um, what we found actually is that if you tried to model this with an electrochemical model, this is done in collaboration with uh, Partha Mukherjee's group at Purdue, we find that you can't actually reproduce the experimental curve that we measure, the electrochemical curve, unless you take into account the distribution of spots. And in fact, this distribution of, of isolated small contact spots causes a significant um, uh, resistance in the cell. This is what's known as a constriction resistance. And this is actually what, what causes the cell to fail uh, eventually. Um, it's not that there's just a loss of contact, it's that there's a loss of contact that forms these isolated small spots. So this sort of analysis is um, important for any sort of solid state battery, not just this solid electrolyte that we um, talked about. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's an important a demonstration uh, uh, a few years ago that we made that can show that uh, this sort of contact loss is the important driving um, failure mechanism for many sorts of cells. All right, great. So um, I'll just mention one other slide here. So uh, this whole first part was focused on this X-ray tomography imaging capability. And we've done some other work uh, using this sort of technique as well. This is on a totally different material system. Um, this is on an oxide solid electrolyte, so a, kind of a stiff ceramic. And I'll just highlight the, the end results here. So what I just showed you previously was that you can have contact loss interfaces, which drives failure. Um, in these particular experiments with this different material, we actually found that um, uh, this material uh, failure was driven by fracture, uh, like significant fracture, um, complete fracture of the material in the spider web like pattern. So these, these blue lines are, are cracks that have grown through the material. And in this particular case, so if you're an expert in this area, you know that fracture can happen due to lithium dendrite growth. In this particular case, it was a little different actually. This fracture was driven by um, interfacial instabilities and volume change due to interface growth at the interface. So not that important for those that um, are not in this field, but uh, the point is that we can kind of differentiate between failure mechanisms with this sort of technique, which is kind of cool. All right, great. So I will move on um, to the next section here. This is uh, some more recent work that we're pretty excited about. Um, this is focused, uh, kind of a similar focus. We're still talking about solid state batteries. We're still talking about lithium metal anodes in solid state batteries. 
But now I'm going to uh, discuss a specific sort of, of solid state technology, which we call the, the anode free solid state battery or the lithium free solid state battery. This is kind of confusing terminology, I think. What this means basically is, uh, is shown by this image here. In normal, well, maybe in, in most solid state battery testing with lithium metal anodes, you have a configuration, something like this. Some of the thicknesses may be different, but you basically start out with a lithium metal foil. Um, and that takes space and it has some weight to it, of course. But you actually don't need to do that um, for a battery system because all the lithium is initially contained in your cathode anyway. And so long story short, the highest energy density you can get when you're using a conventional type cathode is to combine the cathode with a separator and then have nothing at the anode, the active or no active material at the anode. You just have a current collector. So I, I worry that uh, if you're not a battery expert in the audience, this may not make a lot of sense, um, but uh, I hope it does. Um, basic idea is we're trying to get to the highest energy density possible by, by starting with no lithium metal in the cell, which is, which is the goal. And um, this may seem sort of obvious uh, to some of you, and it kind of is, but um, the thing is this sort of uh, architecture on the left has been studied quite a lot in the literature, uh, whereas this one on the right has been studied a lot less. And so the, in the solid state battery community, we have a pretty good understanding of what limits, I mean, actually we don't fully understand, but there's an improved understanding of what limits the behavior in this situation over here. As I just showed you, there's this, this um, phenomenon where we form voids upon stripping the lithium. There's also, uh, when you try to plate the lithium too quickly, you can form filaments and dendrites, which short circuit the cell. But the question is, uh, if you start with no lithium, you have to grow lithium onto a different material, a current collector. How does that affect these mechanisms? And um, we, when we started this work, we didn't really, of course, we didn't know the answer to that. And we didn't know if there would be an answer that was different, actually. And it turns out there is um, some slightly different behavior, which is kind of interesting. So this is what, uh, this is a, um, an X-ray tomography experiment of uh, an anode-free solid state battery. So this is very similar to what we just looked, like, looked at. The one thing that's different here is that we're using a different solid electrolyte. This is uh, our geodite. Li6 PS5Cl material, which is what I'll be talking about for the remainder of the talk. This is a, a high conductivity material, very, very good material that's also quite stable in contact with lithium in contrast to the material I was just talking about. Right, so this, this is a similar X-ray tomography experiment to what I just showed. This is just an image, but the video is shown on the right. If you zoom in at the interface up here, you can see that there's this like it opens and then closes and then opens again. So what's happening is we're actually growing lithium at these interface and then stripping the lithium and it closes. And so this is this is the behavior that you'd expect to see if, uh, with this sort of experiment uh, in an anode free solid state battery. And these particular experiments, we, we can segment out and analyze the different phases and lithium growing and things like that. Um, so, so what do I have to say about this? So we've done a lot of analysis of these anode free solid state batteries. And um, this is the sort of cell we use for this. This is a pressure cell where we're applying a stack pressure. We do these experiments in the glove box. Um, so in this case, this is what the stack looks like. We have a thick lithium counter electrode. We have our solid uh, cold press solid electrolyte, and then we have a copper foil. And interestingly, what we found, um, so th there has not been much published in the literature on this sort of measurement. What we found was even with cold pressed, relatively low density solid electrolyte, you can actually get very large amounts of lithium to deposit on a copper foil current collector. At, at relatively low current densities, 0.5 milliamps per centimeter squared, you can get over hundred microns of lithium, which is way more than you would need for a real battery. So that's interesting. So you can deposit a lot of lithium fairly reliably. Um, you do have to be very careful about the pressure distribution in these cells that can strongly affect the behavior. But if you optimize the cell, you can get very good performance. If you go to higher current density, what you see is you can still get a lot of lithium. This is about um, 20 or 30 microns of lithium, but um, the, uh, you, you short circuit more quickly. And so what's happening in these experiments, we're running until it short circuits. So we can, uh, we can repeatedly get you know, over hundred microns of lithium at low current densities and the higher ones we get, um, we still get a lot, but, but not as much before short circuit. So this was surprising because actually when we first started this, we because there hadn't been a lot published, we didn't know if we could get any lithium on, on the copper. And in fact, you can, uh, if you do it carefully. Um, so large plating capacities are possible, um, but what we found through some analysis, uh, through some characterization was that in general, when you're growing lithium directly on copper or other substrates, 
you often get these very non-uniform deposits. And by non-uniform, I mean there's significant thickness variations. And so here's an example. This is another X-ray imaging experiment where um, the, the imaging is shown over here. And this is a, a two-dimensional heat map of the lithium thickness across the current collector. And you can see in the, uh, the, the lighter regions is a thicker region, the darker regions are thinner. And so the, the thickness actually varies from like uh, 20 microns or 15 microns all the way up to 50 or 60 microns. So it varies quite a lot over, over the uh, current collector. Uh, and, and we found uh, through, I don't think I have the data here, but through other measurements, through FIB measurements as well, uh, that at lower current densities, there's a greater tendency toward more uniform lithium. When you go to higher current densities, you get more non-uniform lithium. And so how does this affect behavior? Well, what we found, so I told you that we can deposit a lot of lithium. The lithium tends to be somewhat non-uniform in thickness. And it turns out that we think that when we start cycling these cells, when we try to charge and discharge, basically, that's when this plays a big role. And that's when we see significant uh, behavior deviations from, from normal lithium excess cells. So this is an example. This is a, a half cell, an anode-free half cell, uh, where we deposit lithium and then we, then we strip it, then we deposit again and we, and we cycle it until it short circuits. And it turns out that it short circuits very rapidly in only third, three cycles. And this is very consistent with lots of measurements we did. Very difficult to get more than like five cycles when we're depositing and stripping from uh, a current collector. And this is in contrast with, if we have thick lithium on both sides, we can get hundreds of cycles when you're going at uh, relatively low current densities. Um, it's very stable. So clearly there's some different behavior here. Same thing uh, holds true in full cells. We did similar experiments in full cells. You always see much more rapid short cir circuiting when you're cycling a full cell compared to uh, with an anode-free anode uh, compared to a lithium excess anode. So why is this? So this is our proposed mechanism. And we think this is pretty important. Uh, so basically th this schematic here kind of visualizes the mechanism. So I'll explain it to you. After you plate lithium, uh, your situation probably looks something like this. You have lithium on the copper current collector, there's a solid electrolyte, there's probably some slightly non-uniform thickness to the lithium. So now let's take that lithium and let's strip it, right? So we strip it here, and what happens is towards the end of stripping, um, a lot of your lithium has been removed, but you still have, you necessarily still have lithium left over because you haven't stripped at all, but that lithium is probably um, not distributed homogeneously across your interface. And so I've shown that here. So there's like a lithium island here. There's some lithium over here. And this is really the important thing. We think when this happens, and it happens probably almost um, uncontrollably, it's probably very difficult to uh, prevent this from happening because of just slight changes and slight differences in thickness or slight differences in current density across the interface. When this happens, these last lithium islands that are left over will feel a very large local current density because all the current you're applying is basically concentrated right in these islands because there's no more lithium to strip at the current collector. And so because of this, this well-known process occurs where the current density increases at these islands. And so you have local voiding at these islands where you form voids. And then when you try to redeposit lithium, um, the voids again, concentrate the deposition current. And that's when you grow filaments to kill the cell, to short circuit the cell. So just to, just to be very clear here, the key mechanism that we think is new here is this process where when you're stripping lithium, and it's somewhat non-uniform at the very end of stripping, uh, you concentrate the current and necessarily form voids. And we think that's the key limitation actually to, to anode-free solid state batteries. This is some modeling that um, was done um, by a collaborating group um, at Imperial College London, Emilio Martinez Pineda's group. They have a very nice phase field model where they're able to show, they pr predict where voids will form uh, in a full um, kind of uh, uh, simulation of, of stripping. And so we're showing here, basically, this is kind of a simplistic model where we have a little bit of a protrusion here of lithium, perhaps like this up here. And we see as we strip pretty uniformly across the interface, as soon as the rest of the lithium around that protrusion is stripped, we get a massive current concentration. And actually this model predicts that voids will form based on the diffusivity and mechanical deformation and current density at this protrusion. So this supports this, this mechanism that we're proposing. So this is a little bit detailed, and again, I apologize if, uh, if you're not working in this area exactly, but um, I think big picture, this is an important finding that identifies a, a key limitation for anode-free batteries. And there are ways around it, potentially. There's ways that we can engineer the interface to allow for much more uniform lithium and to prevent this kind of depletion at the end of stripping. Uh, one possible way, oh, I'll just mention this. We have some experimental evidence for this um, 
this idea, this uh, contact loss at the very end of stripping as well. And this is with impedance spectroscopy. So I won't go into the details here because it's a little bit uh, in depth. Um, but back to the idea of overcoming this challenge. So uh, there's a number of different ways that you could modify these interfaces. There's a lot of work that's been done actually on, on developing different interfacial modifications. We've looked at the effects of alloy layers. And um, basically the idea is that if you put an alloy layer on this copper, even very thin material that's not lithium, some other material, uh, actually you could significantly improve coulombic efficiency and cyclability without short circuiting. And this is kind of understood in the sense that other people have reported similar things, but the, the mechanism by which this is happening is not clear at all. And we think it relates to what, what I just said, basically this idea that at the end of stripping on a bare interface, you, you have current constrictions and void formation. Um, so uh, basically we, we show with these different alloy layers that um, uh, they reduce the impedance growth um, as you cycle these cells. Um, this is a, a bare copper and these are two different alloy layers with much more stable impedance. But we also see very interesting behavior um, physically uh, and morphologically. Uh, in, in, this, in this case, um, we're looking at uh, how these alloy layers evolve. They start to be, they start as very thin layers, just about hundred nanometers. This is, um, these are FIB measurements now, we're, we're SEM imaging um, a cross section that we've cut into of the cell after deposition of lithium. Without any modification, you can see this dark region is lithium at the top and it's quite non-uniform. There's actually some lithium that grows into the solid electrolyte. Uh, there's some pores and voids uh, in the lithium itself. With two different alloy layers, we see that first of all, the material is much more uniform, but second of all, the, the alloys themselves do some kind of funky things. Uh, uh, they break up into particles and they kind of are transported to different places throughout the, uh, the lithium, which is kind of interesting. Um, but we see that they, they stabilize the cycling as well. All right, great. So I only have a few more minutes here. I'll, uh, I'll maybe spend another five minutes or so. Um, uh, uh -oh. um, and uh, uh, I'll just finish up with um, some of our, our, our other work on solid state batteries. So um, in addition to lithium metal, which is what I've been talking about primarily so far, my group is working on other anode materials, in particular alloy based materials. Um, we work on them actually for, for conventional lithium ion batteries, but, but um, we become quite interested in their use for solid state batteries. This is, uh, this, these plots here are from a paper we published last year, a perspective paper in Juul about the promise of alloy anodes for solid state batteries. And the plot here on the left is, are, are energy estimates based on this uh, material stack within a cell uh, for different sorts of electrode materials um, in solid state batteries. So it's a little bit of a complicated plot, but it plots the energy density in watt hours per liter um, against the specific energy in watt hours per kilogram. And so of course you want, you know, the higher, further up and to the right, the better. Um, what you see though is, so up here we have our lithium metal based solid state batteries, especially um, in the purple uh, and the, the red here. Um, so the anode free has the highest uh, energy behavior. Uh, what you see though is the alloy materials like silicon, aluminum, tin, these are different alloys that can, they, uh, when I say alloy, they react with lithium and they host lithium in their structure. Uh, they also have very high energy density. In particular, uh, you can reach energy densities that, uh, that approach that or, or quite similar to that of cells with a little bit of excess lithium. So there's a big energy advantage to, uh, to um, going after these alloy based materials for solid state batteries as well. And they're quite a bit higher than just a conventional lithium ion cell, which is shown approximated down here. So from an energy perspective, um, there's, there's uh, some advantages here. And so that's why we're interested. Uh, this is just a schematic on the right of what one of these cells might look like. This is just a material level stack. Um, you have a composite cathode with perhaps NMC or another material, a solid state electrolyte layer, and then um, some alloy anode material, which can, there's a bunch of different possibilities. Right, so what are alloys? I probably should have said this first. Uh, and a lot of you may be familiar with this. There's been a lot of work on silicon, for instance, over the years. Um, silicon is probably the prototypical example of an alloy anode. Uh, conventional battery materials operate via an intercalation mechanism, which means basically that the lithium ions are inserted into the crystal structure of the material. And because of that, um, there's, there's relatively small volume changes during lithium insertion and extraction. 
Um, and, and that's good for cyclability and reversibility because there's not, there's not these big changes which can cause problems. Alloy materials are different. They undergo very large volume changes. They can incorporate a lot of lithium uh, in their structures. They, they undergo structural changes too during this process. But the, by, by large volume changes, I mean they can expand by 300% even um, during lithium insertion, which is uh, very hard to manage kind of at a material level. And in liquid cells, conventional lithium ion batteries, this has been a big problem because it causes a lot of uh, interphase growth, SEI growth and secondary reactions and things like that, which limit performance. I will, I will mention though, there are a number of companies that have spent uh, the past decade trying to overcome this problem. And there's been a lot of success, especially recently. Uh, Sela Nanotechnologies is one company that has had a lot of success. They have a, a commercial product now. There are other companies as well um, commercializing silicon for lithium ion batteries. Uh, and silicon is used in very small proportions in, in commercial cells now, but these companies are, are developing high silicon content electrodes. So anyway, it's a challenge. It's, been, it's a longstanding challenge. And so we were interested in getting into this to try to understand how these sorts of structural and volumetric changes um, are affected by the chemomechanical environment of solid state batteries, because there might be some advantages there. And indeed there are, it seems. Um, these are some experiments basically uh, that we did a few years ago where you, you take um, an NMC cathode and you mix different sorts of alloy uh, particles with, with a solid electrolyte at the anode. In this case, this is silicon microparticles. And uh, you cycle them in a battery. And these particular experiments here are showing silicon microparticles um, in a composite anode cycling uh, over 100 cycles um, with, with very limited capacity decay. So it's quite stable. And interestingly, if you compare this to uh, very similar particles cycled in that liquid half cell, they have very rapid capacity decay. It's, it's well known that these micron sized particles just really don't work very well at all in, in liquid cells. This is because of SCI growth. And actually, uh, Kind of funny. This this data came from my PhD thesis. Uh, this terrible data, like you never see data that's bad in a paper. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, these these uh, solid state batteries seem to be behaving much better when you use these silicon microparticles. And I, and of course, I should not. Uh, uh, I have to mention um, Shirley Mung's very nice paper on this, which came out um, last year as well, or two years ago now, uh, down here in Science. They use basically pure silicon, almost pure silicon electrodes, and show that they can get very good performance um, in solid state batteries. So, um, yeah, very interesting behavior. There's a lot of questions around this. I think a lot of groups are working on this now. Um, but the question we were asking in this particular paper a few years ago was how does stack pressure affect these alloy reactions? Can we use these sorts of measurements to understand behavior? So in these measurements, um, we, we built solid state batteries uh, with different alloy materials. Here we're looking at antimony, tin, and silicon. And um, these are just three different, they all react with a lot of lithium, but they're different materials that behave slightly differently. We made composite electrodes. This is a fib image of a composite electrode. The bright regions are um, the active material, in this case, antimony, and the darker regions are the salt electrolyte. We put these in our pressure cells. And in this particular pressure cell, we have a, a force sensor actually. So we can act, not only can we measure the stack pressure we're applying, but we can then measure the, the stack pressure as it changes during battery cycling. And that's what, the, uh, what we were doing here. Um, right, so this is what these experiments look like. So we cycle these cells, these are full cells with NMC cathodes. Uh, you, see, you, know, you have charge, discharge, charge, discharge with the antimony, with the tin, with the silicon electrodes. There's quite a lot of data on this slide. I apologize for that. But if you compare now um, how the, the, the stress changes, the stack pressure in all these cells, that's the red curves down here. So they all start at 20 megapascals. That's where we apply that much stack pressure. And um, when we charge the cell, the, uh, the stack pressure increases and then discharge, it decreases. And this happens in all three cases. This is expected because what this means is when we charge the cell, when we move lithium from the NMC to the alloy, there's a net volume increase. And that, that's true because actually the, the partial molar volume of lithium in the alloy is larger than that in the cathode. And so um, this results, uh, we measure the pressure increase here, but this is due to the net volume increase in the cell stack. And in general, this is a much larger stress change than in, in uh, similar liquid cells because of the, the nature of the all solid state environment. And so that's what I just described here. I won't go into the details of the theory, um, but we learned some interesting stuff from these experiments. Uh, 
one thing we learned is kind of highlighted here. Um, this, these are measurements, the same measurements I just showed, but plotted in a different way. Uh, this is for a composite 10 electrode. And what you can see is that th this is the stress measurement down here. As we charge and discharge, uh, the, the stress increases and then decreases, but it increases non-linearly. And there's also a hysteresis between the increase and decrease. And this is interesting because uh, uh, this is not what you'd expect theoretically. Theoretically, if you just have a planar foil, um, what you expect is just linear behavior without hysteresis. And that's what we see with a planar foil measurement. So why is this happening? Um, actually, we think that this hysteresis and the nonlinearity can tell you something about the structure of the electrode itself, the structure of the Uh-oh, we have a, so somebody's unmuted here. Um, uh, right, so the, if you have a lot of um, open space in your composite, then that can accommodate some of the volume change without um, stress changes. So we think that's what we're learning here. Uh, we also learned that the size of the active material matters, so the particle size. For smaller particles, you have a lower stress changes. So anyway, this sort of measurement can be quite useful for analyzing uh, uh, electrode behavior and also uh, uh, understanding how structure of electrodes influences behavior. All right, so I think with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish. Uh, that highlights some of our work in these areas. Uh, in conclusion, I will say that. Um, I think in a number of these examples, you saw that uh, the, the relationship between chemistry and mechanics and stress evolution plays a big role from the, the void formation, contact loss, anode-free behavior to this, uh, these in-situ stress measurements at the end. Uh, and also, we, you know, my group uses in-situ and operando techniques, and they can be very useful for understanding behavior as well. All right, so I will um, thank my group members. Uh, a lot of the folks who did the work are highlighted uh, or bolded up here on um, the list. So uh, uh, very appreciative and thankful for their hard work. Um, some of the collaborators that we work with are shown here in the middle and then our funding sources down here. So um, again, I appreciate your attention on this Friday evening or uh, earlier afternoon, depending on where you are. And um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Matt, for this wonderful talk. Um, so now, uh, any questions from the audience? We got a big, big crowd today here. All right, uh, I'm going to start some questions first. To uh, all right, there's one question in the chat. Is that a question? Yes. The question in the yes, chat. Yes, I see that. Um, thank you for your nice talk. I read many of your work, really inspired a lot. Uh, notice yeah. this video without any interface protection in the field, which is much higher than many reported work. Can you give some suggestion? Okay. How did yeah, this? yeah. The, the, thank you for the question. So the question is about the critical current density in um, some of our, our papers. So actually, I didn't really talk. I think you're referring to a paper that perhaps I didn't talk about. Um, but this there's some data from